In all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Man, is that a word? It's beautiful, and it's strong, and it is powerful. These are words of hope for God's people. To know that God's love is stronger than anything that we will ever encounter. Now, I'll admit, I'm a little bit biased, not just because I think these words are really good, but I think the first time, I have, I have a really deep memory of the first time that I think I really heard these words. Now, I say really heard because I think there are times when we hear scripture, but it doesn't truly hit us. You know, we don't truly hear it every time we hear God's word. I think that's part of why we're called to keep reading and rereading scripture. But I think the very first time that I really fell in love with this particular passage, I was, I was in, I think it was 10th grade, I was in high school, and I was at the Warren Willis United Methodist Youth Camp in Leesburg, Florida. Have any of you guys been there before? Have, okay, well, how many of y'all have been there as campers? As, yeah, there we go. That camp has a really long, rich history in this conference. There's a lot of things I'm proud of as a United Methodist, um, and one of those things is that we, I feel like we do a really good job of caring for children and youth and young adults. You know, to say that these are people, these, are, these, are, these children are part of our church, and we prioritize that, I think that's an incredible thing to be proud of. Um, but I was a camper at Warren Willis United Methodist Youth Camp, um, which is a really long word for church camp. And um, there's a, it's a beautiful campus. You know, there's a big lake and there's camping and there's canoeing, or not camping, sailing, camping on a lake. That would be pretty bad. There's canoeing and there's sailing on the lake, but something else, and something else you do as part of, part of the week, you're in a small group. And so uh, usually it's about twice a day. You go and you meet with, it's usually about 12 people different campers your age, um, but then there's also an adult, usually an adult volunteer, and then some sort of a team member. The team members are usually their college students, their young adults who have decided to give their summer to God, um, to spend their entire summer just loving middle school and high school kids and, and fourth and fifth graders. They spend their summer loving these kids and sharing the word of God with them. And so I was one of those campers being loved on by a counselor. And usually the small groups, usually camp starts on Monday and it ends on Saturday. So usually Monday, pretty much all you do is you get there, you check in, you put your stuff in, in a, um, one of the, the lodges. Um, and then so your first time meeting your small group, it's mostly just names and introductions. You know, hi, my name is Emily. I'm from Daytona Beach. I'm here. I'm excited. I've been to camp before, you know, that kind of thing. And so by Tuesday, you've just barely gotten to know folks, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's still that, that forming relationships, that encourages you to open up and have deeper conversations throughout the week. So usually there's this progression of it starts off kind of awkward, just names, and then as the week goes on and you talk more, you get to know each other more, the conversation gets deeper and deeper, and you, you experience and you express things that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to share, but because those relationships are forming, deep things happen. You challenge one another. You pray for one another. You grow. And again, as a Christian, as a, especially as a United Methodist, I would say that small groups are really the key to spiritual formation. You know, if you are, if you are in a small group or if you've ever experienced this in a small group, you know what I'm talking about. Worship is important. It's important to gather. It's important to give glory to God. That is our call. That's why we gather for worship is to give praise to God. But we're also called to grow. And I really think it's on that small group level when you have those real conversations, when you have that opportunity to ask questions about scripture and really challenge one another, that's where you grow. That I think is a huge part of the church. And so if you are not in a small group, 
I encourage you to pray for one. Pray, prayerfully consider being a part of one. I know we're starting some new small groups in September. Um, and if you are in a small group already, then I ask you to be praying for the September small groups. Being, be, be in prayer for spiritual depth to really take root in this congregation, because we need that, and it happens in small groups. But I'm digressing. Uh, so this was, like I said, this was Tuesday, their second day in this small group. And we were walking back as an act, from an activity. We were walking back to the little cabin where we were going to meet and, and discuss things and talk. And so, and like I said, these were folks that we barely knew each other. But we were walking, and we happened to be standing in this grassy field that's right next to the chapel. Usually it's where people play frisbee. But we were walking, and one of the girls in the small group, she just said, stop. She said, will you please stop And I don't know what it is, I don't know why it's this moment, but I really, I want you guys to pray for me. Pray for me because I have grown up in the church and I have heard Jesus all my life, but I don't know what it is about this moment. But right now, I really want you to pray for me because I really want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Oh man, that was a glorious moment. To hear, to be standing next to somebody who gave their life to Jesus Christ for the very first time is a powerful moment. Because it's true. I think there's a lot of us that we grow up in the church and we hear Jesus just like we hear scripture and we don't always, always let it sink in. But even for those of us who have encountered Christ in in that life-changing kind of way, I think we're all called to constantly return to Christ and constantly turn back and say, God, all right, my life, I give it up. I'm trying to take care of too many of these details. I am trying to control too much of my life. God, I give it to you. I give you my life and my heart. Jesus Christ, come into my life. Even Christians who have been strong Christians, we're called to return to that place time and time and time again. It's growth. It's discipleship. That's what we do. But there is something really beautiful and powerful and incredibly exciting about standing there and laying hands on somebody and praying for them when they've done that for the very first time. And again, if you have experienced that, then you know exactly the joy that I'm talking about. And if you haven't experienced it, then again, I encourage you to pray for that moment. Specifically say, hey God, I want to stand and pray for somebody when they're accepting Jesus Christ for the first time. I want to have that encounter. God, bring that into my life. Because I think prayer is something we pray, I think God wants to know what we want, but I also think prayer changes us. And I think if you pray that prayer, if you pray, God, help me to be there when somebody accepts you for the first time, praying that prayer, I think, enables you to see folks and to look for those opportunities. And I think once you're open to those relationships and you're looking for God to come and move in a powerful way, I think we are more likely to see it when it does happen. But this particular experience, like I said, it was beautiful and, you know, she was there and it was the grass and the sunshine and, you know, and we all just laid hands on this this girl that we had barely known and we prayed for her and we celebrated and it was a beautiful, incredible moment for the church. It was a great moment for the kingdom of God um, and then it was a powerful moment for that small group. I'll tell you what, when when you're starting your small group out on Tuesday with a moment like that, oh man, best small group I've ever been a part of. I have never gotten to such a level of depth with folks in one week than I did in that week. And and so it was one of those moments that we had prayed and we were standing there and it was, you know, we were all really excited and enthusiastic and we were kind of like, all right, where do we go from here? You know, it's Tuesday. Surely the rest of this week can't be this good. But what we did is we went back to that small group hut, that small group cabin, and this is the passage that we read. This is, the, the, uh, that small group happened to be led by a pastor, and so he, he was the one that said, all right, here's what I want you to do. We're going to read Romans 8, the very end of Romans 8. And so whenever I read this passage, that's the scene that comes to mind, that first coming to Christ, remembering my first love and passion for Christ and others. In that moment of coming to Christ with freshness, these are the words that were read. In all things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. 
For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That moment, that kind of love is something that cannot be shaken off. And I'll admit, I think that's part of the reason why I love this scripture. But I also think that the 12 of us gathered in that little non-air-conditioned hut, I think we heard these words in our celebration. We probably heard these words a little bit differently than the church in Rome heard them. You know, because when the church in Rome was hearing these words, they weren't sitting on a beautifully manicured church property. They probably were not sitting in a, in a country where they were free to completely believe in what they wanted. You see, the early church, the church in Rome, the church that Paul sent these words to was a church that was heavily persecuted. You see, when we read these words in our context, we take verse 36 for granted. Verse 36 that says, For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. Yeah, I read that and I'm like, wow, that's, that's a little harsh. Seems a little bit out of context, out of all of this victorious language. But for the early church, I think it was less out of place and more their reality. The church in Rome, they were facing deliberate persecutions. You know, Christians were being taken out of their homes. They were being taken to the Colosseum. They were, they were put in front of lions. They were killed and slaughtered for their faith. But they heard these words the same. For all things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Even in the midst of persecution, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, none of these things, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Because you see, these words are words of power and hope in good times, but they're also words of power and hope in bad times as well. And the flip side, I think, of these verses is not just that we celebrate this in the good, but it's, it's admitting the reality that there will be difficult times. There are going to be times when we struggle with our faith. There are going to be times when situations happen that we don't understand. We are going to lose loved ones in this world. Families are going to struggle with finances. People are going to struggle with jobs. There is going to be persecution in different forms. I'm thankful, I'm very thankful that we don't have to face the Colosseum, we don't have to face lions, we don't have to face bears. But that does not mean that these words are any less for us. And I will say that when we struggle, those are moments, and I've said it before, it's when we struggle with our faith that we're challenged and we grow. And that's, again, why I think this passage is so powerful because it also says that God is with us. Who will be against us? And it says that God works all things together for good. And I don't don't think that that means that God causes bad things to happen. I don't think that God caused persecution on purpose. I don't think that God causes death or sickness But I do think that in the midst of sickness, in the midst of death, in the midst of struggles, we are still conquerors because God is over all of that. When I lived in North Carolina, I had a very good friend, um, and I'll just, I'll say that her name was Jenny, and she, um, she herself was somebody who had been raped when she was younger. And it was a horrible tragedy, and I firmly believe that at no point did God plan for that to happen to her? At no point do I ever think that God is okay with anything like that happening to people. And for her, it was a really difficult thing for her to go through. It took a long time for her to get to a place of healing. It took a long time for her to get to a place of, of reconciliation with herself, with her body, with other people. But she did get there. And she was an incredible testimony to God's goodness because what she did is she turned around and she organized um, and made sure that she was a part of the Rape Crisis Center. 
So when she, when other, when other women went through what she went through, or, or men went through what she went through, she was there for them. Out of her tragedy, out of her persecution, God brought hope for other people. Out of bad things, I do think that God works together for good. Because even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of struggle, God is with us working for good, bringing us to hope, bringing us to remember that, you know, God is bigger still. Because nothing will separate us from the love of God. And in those moments when we do feel like we turn away, just as that spirit prays on our behalf, I do believe that Jesus Christ comes and, and testifies on our behalf too. Working things for good, giving us comfort, giving us strength, giving us the word of God. Because I do believe that Christ died and that Christ rose from the dead and that means that Christ is alive still. And that means that God is working here and now. So that's why these words are powerful. I am convinced that in all things we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth neither depression nor the loss of a loved one neither the loss of a job neither a financial struggle neither our own insecurities neither our own addictions not even a marriage who is struggling, not even a friend who has wronged us, not even a spouse who we have troubled to get along with, none of these things, none of these things will separate us from the love of God. For in all things we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has conquered death, been brought to life, and who lives still with us. Amen. So I, as my brothers and sisters, I encourage you guys, as you go forth this week, be mindful, first of all, of that tug and that pull of Christ on your life, on your heart. Um, and if you feel like God is calling you to accept Jesus for the first time. I don't care if you've been in this church for 87 years. Um, if that's something that you are feeling called to do, let us know and we will lay hands and we will pray and we will celebrate with you. And if you have been in this church for 87 years and you made that promise 87 years ago and you feel called again to give your life to Christ, then I encourage you again, give your life to Christ. And our word this morning may be nothing Nothing that separates us from God, but I pray that you will leave this place and not say nothing. I pray that you will leave this place saying victory, saying life, saying hope and love to others. So go forth with the grace and peace of God, loving others, knowing that the love of God cannot be shaken and goes with you. So in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go forth in grace and peace. Amen.